interesting parts of a community is the work group. They are cohorts unlike any other because A, people statistically spend more time with them, at least actively, than any other grouping, and B, they are considered secondary and temporary. Since so much is accomplished within these collectives, it's intriguing that they don't hold more importance within society. We often know co-workers better than family members due to how much time is spent communicating with them. Also, that's where society gets its production from. Any task that's completed of a grand scale or of great influence comes from people working with other people. And oftentimes, the results are extraordinary. Skyscrapers, dams, bridges that span the widest waterways, all of these are monuments to effective teamwork and determination. People build more than physical structures, though. They build moral codes that create conscience, social policies that create governments, and visions that become films. This last one's the youngest kind of group work we've created. Film crews take scripts and turn them into reality, taking imagination and putting it firmly within the audience's grasp. Great films transcend the communication and speak directly to the mind on a level no other medium can. But what if some of these imaginings it's telling us are not so false? What if someone borrowed from the real world a creature of nightmares, presenting it like any other concoction of a fevered night drenched in the sweat of fear? perhaps taking the Lone Hunter of the Darkness and bringing it into the spotlight, if only to convince the audience that nightmares could be real. Well, if you put that particular formula all together, you get the year 2000's Shadow of the Vampire. Starring John Malkovich and Willem Dafoe, Shadow tells of the making of the 1922 feature Nosferatu, positing that the actor who played the vampire was actually a blood-sucking fiend. It also describes the lengths that the crew must go to when working with the hungry undead, and trying to make it appear as though everything was going according to plan. How far will men go to make reality appear like a dream? Let's dive into this dark hole of creativity and see what creatures lurk within. Meet Frederick Murnau, famed German director of the 1920s, and he takes full advantage of the silent film medium. You wear pretty clothes, and you're married to a kind man who's promised to love you forever. So, running commentary was invented long before DVDs. Good to know. He's the mad genius behind the vision. Doing Dracula without mentioning Dracula. Technically, Nosferatu is one of the most successful and famous ripoffs ever made, creating a mythos around vampires that lingers to this day. All due to this man. How dare you! How dare you destroy my photographer! You idiot! Did I kill? Some of your people, Marno. I can't remember. Why him, you monster? Why not the script girl? Greatness has its price. Frederick's constant worry and reward comes in the form of Count Orlock, played by Willem Dafoe. According to rumors, it's this performance that inspired the producers of Spider-Man to make him the Green Goblin. And I see it. Willem's Orlock harbors a subtle ferocity. That kind of questioning anxiety every time you see him in a scene. You don't know whether he's going to snap the man's neck or just take his drink from his hand. That's the kind of madness you need in a villain. The crew is told from the start that Orlok is Max Schreck, that surname being the German word for fear, so it's clearly not fake. He's a method actor, Frederick explains, and all should treat him as Count Orlok for the duration of the filming. But we've all known that guy at work before, you know, the delusional one. Either he thinks he's a comedian, or well, he's not funny at all, but you better humor him because he's been there 14 years. Or that guy who hides in the hole in the wall behind the filing cabinet, claiming that those hobbitses have stolen his precious. They're not crazy at all. Frederick drags the crew up to Orlok's lair, where he introduces the vampire in the most eerie way possible. Meet Count Orlok. Lurking out of a dark hole in an ancient ruin is in no way a danger to his fellow man. Look! Nosferatu! Blood! Blood! <laughs> Damn it. Unless it's in the script. So in this clearly perilous location with an obviously demented lead, you'd think that the people would be more wary. Well, no, why would they be? It's all part of the work they do, every day. See, film gave the license for things usually seen as bizarre to exist in the real world. As an example, let's say you dressed up as a zombie and jumped out of a pile of leaves at pedestrians before chasing them down the street. Do this without a camera, you'll get arrested. Get the right paperwork and film it, you've got a viral video on YouTube. 
The world is weird. The whole film crew just sees this as another shoot. There's only one man who doesn't, and that's the producer Alban Grau, played by Udo Kier. It's his job to make sure things go off without a hitch, and given the nature of his star, he's got his hands full. To fully outline how he manipulates the crew to the fullest extent, let's go ask the master of the craft. You thoroughly rip the chain link fence out of the ground, and it sets off every alarm in the place. Uh, six armed guards quickly swarm onto you and level their guns at you. What do you do? Oh, uh, I hold up the fence like a shield against a gunfire and stand my ground! <laughs> Alright! I'm gonna need more dice for this glorious moment. Before you get to that, I've got someone for you to analyze. Oh, but I was just about to kill Bacchus! Soon, DM. Soon. Mm, all my fun. Who am I talking about? The producer from Shadow of the Vampire. Ah! Finally, somebody I can sympathize with. Alban Grau was the man in charge of making other men's visions come true. While the director had his fun calling the shots, Alban made sure the set was spotless. While the writer worried about pathos, Grau ensured the actress was motivated enough to express it. Further, when he found out that his director had hired a real vampire, he found a clever way to eliminate him and still keep his shooting schedule. He's a hero, really. Wasn't he just enabling an obsessed person's desire, though? For a very good reason. To tell a story. He's the faceless leader of the crew, orchestrating the flow of production and greasing the wheels for his players to make magic happen for the camera. Without his tireless efforts, none of this could have ever happened. So you're saying he did a good thing? Clearly, you weren't listening. He made something happen that would have otherwise been impossible. That's the most important thing. So the fact that the original production was in hot water from the get-go for being a blatant copy-paste of Bram Stoker's Dracula... You mean a creative reimagining of Dracula. And it brought the courts down on it so hard that it not only bankrupted the production studio, but destroyed every copy of the film in Germany, means it was a complete success. Considering the fact that we're still talking about this movie 90 years after it came out, I'd say he did his job. Making the group work together is the hardest trick a storyteller performs. When it performs well, it's legendary. When that effort is put to film, it's history. Alban Grau used the best of his influence against the logic of the day and the law of the land to make something that's still being talked about by film students. If that's not a job well done, then I don't know what is. I question you too often. I agree. Thanks for showing us why Alban was such a cornerstone for the plot. Have fun killing Bacchus. Ooh, I almost forgot! Alright, that's uh, 18 successes. Roll your dodge. Oh yeah! This fence is awesome! So, we have the perfect storm. A man obsessed with the vision, another who will do anything to make it happen, the right man for the job, and the crew to get all the details right. One big group functioning despite the life-threatening complication. But the metaphor of a film being made within a film isn't as meta as this gets. See, Shadow of the Vampire was the first feature made by Saturn Films, a company famous for making sure Nick Cage still has a career. But he actually founded that with the intention of bringing to screen the films he'd always wish that he could see, bringing together talents that he always wanted paired. In the promotional work for Shadow, Cage claimed that he loved working with Malkovich and Defoe on other projects, and he always saw those two getting a chance to work together being a really great moment. Yet, despite owning this company, Nicholas didn't even make a cameo in any of their scenes or anywhere in this picture. He just served as the producer. Combine that with a hand-picked director, whose only other feature at this point was a silent film, and there is another level added to this mix. Nicolas Cage had a vision once he read this script, a script that borrows heavily from a more famous work, making homage to it constantly, yet being distinct enough to merit its own copyright. He found the director who strangely had the perfect credentials to inform the performance of directing silent film and brought together his favorite picks of casting to make what could only happen at that moment in time. A film about capturing a moment before it disappears. Whether intentional or not, Cage helped create a greater situation that helped frame the fictional work in perspective. The work his crew did captured what Frederick and Albin might have gone through nearly a century ago all for the purpose of capturing images onto celluloid. What insanity causes us to do this? Some may say it's actually madness, how so many lose so much to watching or making these films, shorts, or videos, but there is something about this process that still creates emotion, both in the viewer and the maker, when the elements line up just so, 
and a long shadow is cast over everyone that experiences that combination. None of this could happen without small armies of people coming together to make visions come true, if only for the sake of a shot. The work these groups do can be pointless, can be trite, or it can change people's lives. Or, as the case is with Shadow of the Vampire, it can end them in the pursuit of making dreams reality. This film loves its subject matter, and it shows in every frame. Most people are just there to do their job and be done, but those that understand what Frederick and Count Orlock are accomplishing get a glimpse of truly destructive beauty. It's haunting and raw, just like the film that inspired it. If you've ever had interest in the filmmaking process, it's definitely worth your time. Even without that inclination, it will still leave its mark upon you. I'm The Other Socio, and I love this film. While the director had fun calling the shots, Albin made sure the spot was setless. <laughs> it's Dogville all of a sudden. This spot is setless. <laughs> yep.